Well, thank God that he is the potter. Amen. Amen. And we are the clay tonight, church. As you look around tonight, Westfield Baptist Church, God is molding us and shaping us tonight. As you look around, would you have thought you'd seen a crowd like this on Tuesday night? Amen. Amen. Church, look around. God is working. I want to share something with you today that's as amazing as the digital age in which we live. We've been live streaming our revival, and, and, and as of earlier today, I don't know about right this moment, but last night we had 144 views. And church, I want to tell you something, that's amazing because people are watching, and people are wanting to see what's happening at Westfield Baptist Church, amen? Church, look around. God's hand is upon us, and we need to be paying attention to that. I want to share with you just a moment as we talked about our theme for revival. Our theme is to live for Him and to serve Him and to praise Him. Amen? Church, we're in a season right now. I know it's hard to believe today is the first day of spring and they're calling for snow in the morning. Amen? God's got a sense of humor. Praise God. I'm excited to be here tonight, church. I told some of them earlier, if I take off running, y'all just grab a hold of my coattail and hang on tonight because it's amazing. And it's truly, the Spirit is here tonight, church. Suzette, thank you for those songs. I, I thought about when, when Tricia has put this, all the work into the uh, video and, and live streaming, I thought, that's so amazing. And I thought about when Suzette was singing, thought about Tracy up here, those motions. Look at what God is doing here, church. We've seen someone baptized. We've seen a soul get saved. And, and God just keeps pouring His love and His blessings out on our church tonight. And I thought about that song, Magnify. Church, did we come tonight wanting to magnify Him? Amen? That's where our heart should be. That's where our spirit should be tonight. Our sole purpose is to magnify Him. Church, if you come for any other reason tonight, you come for the wrong reason. Brother, I pray God gives you the power tonight. Church, I prayed yesterday that God would give Cameron the boldness to preach the gospel tonight. I pray you have the power to feel the Holy Spirit tonight. Brother, come on. Give us what the Lord's laid on your heart tonight. appreciate you so much. Well, amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Acts, the book of Acts, first chapter. When you go to the movie or when you want to watch your favorite TV program, there's always a commercial. So I'm going to give you a real quick commercial. That'd be okay as you're finding your way. I'm proud of you for being here tonight. And if it starts snowing up a blizzard, I'll just uh, let you know about it because i got a good view. And uh, we're excited. We don't get to see much snow down our way. I think they've already canceled our schools for a week and a half just because they heard y'all were going to have snow. But um, here's my story in a nutshell. Uh, Seventeen and a half years ago, God called me to pastor a small church in a rural community. 246 people, no stoplights, that kind of place. And for about 10 years, uh, we were faithful to try to grow a church, and we realized we were not reaching lost people. 2014, we uh, stepped out and we planted the Lake Church at White Lake. And then last summer, uh, 2017, July the 11th, uh, we purchased a camp at White Lake. So I've got some brochures, and I'm going to leave these here on the offertory table, and you can get those uh, after the service or tomorrow night. And uh, do come see us. Um, we're open and uh, looking forward to meeting people's needs for generations to come. We want to have, help people rediscover North Carolina's oldest waterfront treasure, White Lake, North Carolina. How many of you have ever been to White Lake? Cool. How many of you have been to White Lake in the last 10 years? Yeah, that's what we thought. So we're going to come back and visit with us. I get to pastor a church that has a motel at it. That's pretty amazing. So uh, we encourage you to come. That's the only advertisement I'll give you tonight, unless I feel led to give you another one. Here we go. Acts chapter number 1, verse number 3. You know the story. Jesus is now risen from the grave. The empty tomb has proved his victory. I love the little quote. We'll hear it probably much over Easter, why seek ye the living among the dead? He's not here, he's risen, just like he said. Friend, can I tell you, many people that ride by the doors of the church, they think this is some old dead place. Old folks gather once a week and sing about something that happened a long time ago rather than a place that people come and celebrate what's happening right here and even what's going to happen in the days ahead. Well, Jesus has been, verse 3, after his passion, he's been showing himself alive. Just think about that for a minute, verse 3. He was showing himself alive. That's what we want the church to be about, a place where Christ week in and week out shows himself to be alive. He did this by many infallible proofs. 
being seen of them for 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Well, they assembled together, and we know this is in the upper room. This is the second time Jesus would meet with his followers in an upper room. The Bible says that he commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise. If you take notes or happen to write in your Bible, you can circle the word promise and draw a little line down and put Holy Spirit. That's what the promise is of the Father, which said, You have heard of me. For John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Well, when they were therefore come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know or to understand or to comprehend the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Here we go, verse 8, where we really want to call your attention to. Jesus is having his final discourse. This would be his last interaction, his last word to his followers, how important it is. Listen, friend, I've been there many times when people have passed away. It's always interesting to note the last thing they want to say. Jesus is getting ready to ascend, and he's got one last opportunity to give them a challenge. Remember now, not only a challenge for them, but for now some 2,000 years, we would look back and say, Christ, what is it that you want us to hear as you're getting ready to leave and go and prepare that place for us? Here's what he said. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, that's locally, and in Judea, that's a little bit further out, and in Samaria, that's even further out, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Here, there, and everywhere is my church's mission statement. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, I can see them now, their mouths open just in a gazing and amazement. And the Bible said he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? For this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go. I wanted to read that entire text to help you understand what's going on. When Christ meets with his followers, he said, listen, you've got to understand there's some amazing things that are getting ready to take place. By the way, that's what I'm going to be preaching on tomorrow night. Snow or no snow, come on back. We're going to be talking about the purpose and the promise for the church, and we're looking forward to that. But Jesus would say to them, listen, I want you to come, and I want you to gather, and I want you to be patient, and I want you to wait for the gift of God, which will be the Holy Ghost. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you... There's going to be some requirement of you. There's going to be some responsibility that will be yours then. You must take the power of God and you must channel it and funnel it as you become my witnesses. But when he talks about the Holy Ghost coming upon us, he specifically uses the word dunamis, 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 which means power. We get our word dynamite from this. I want to teach you a little something uh, tonight. How many of you have ever played Paper, rock, scissors. Is that? I always say it wrong. Rock, paper, scissors. Good job. My wife Tiffany's with me. She is an errant and infallible almost as much as the Word of God. And I'm grateful for that. She keeps me straight. And uh, okay, rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors. Y'all say that with me. Rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors. All right, we got it now. I want everybody to find a partner real quick. And somebody beside of you, don't do it. Somebody across the room, it just won't work. And we're going to play one game of... Good job. I'd already gotten forgotten it, you know. Rock, paper, scissors. Okay, let's see here. Who wants to be my partner? You've got one. You want to be my partner? Sorry, bud. You out. All right, here we go. You ready? Everybody getting... Everybody knows you got to get the rules right. You ready? All right, is it paper... I can't ever get it right. Rock, paper, scissor. Okay, rock. No, hold on, hold on. I got, I'm giving you the rules. Calm down, y'all. I like, like you had never played anything before. Here it is. Now, rock, that beats scissors. And, and, and paper, that beats the rock. And the scissors beats the paper. Is that all? 
Okay, so we know the rules. And it's rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors. All right, you ready, preacher? Here we go, y'all. And listen, there, you might have heard that there's no losers. Listen, there are going to be half of you going to be losers in just a minute. All right, here we go. Ready? Rock, paper, dynamite. Here it is, y'all. Listen, there's another, there's something else that maybe you didn't know about. And that's, there's dynamite. That's a whole new tool that's not being used today. And dynamite trumps rock, and it trumps paper, and it trumps scissors. And it's something that we have as the blood bought saints of the living God that the world does not have. And by the way, when the enemy comes against you, all he's got is a handful of rock, paper, and scissors. But you and I have been indwelt by the mighty power of God, the do us, the dynamite, and we literally are more than conquerors. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So tonight we're just going to spend a few minutes looking at the dunamis, at the dynamite that is ours individually as believers and then as the church. Tonight's all about the power of God. Last night the principles, tomorrow night the promise, tonight the power of God. Father, there is nothing profitable that I could say to these people that they need to hear, but God, you have so much that we need to hear. So Father, I pray that you would speak to us clearly. Lord, help us to open our ears and our hearts and our minds and our lives to the teaching of the Word of God, that you would be glorified, that you would be honored. And Father, tonight I pray Lord, if there's one person in this room that has never experienced the saving knowledge of Christ, that tonight their lives would be forever and ever and ever changed by the gospel message as it would penetrate their heart. Lord, that it would save their soul and forever change their life. In Jesus' sweet name. Amen. I love that little illustration. I love that story. I used it uh, probably a year ago or so at the Lake Church. And to this day, there are young people who will ride through the community and I'll be out and about and they'll see me and they'll honk the horn, roll down the window and stick their finger out, this finger. They'll stick this finger out and holler, Dynamite! It'll bless your heart. 120 times in the New Testament, you find the Greek word dunamis. And it literally means the dynamite of God. The power of God. Think about that. All throughout the Word of God, there is creation power. In the Old Testament, we find the priestly power and the prophetic power. And then we jump over into the New Testament and we see the incarnation power through the birth of Christ. We see the gospel power. We see the miraculous power, the redemption power, the resurrection power. And then finally here, we come to see the Pentecostal power. Now, don't let that scare you. Don't think for a moment that this is just for those who, who, who are out there somewhere, charismatic running the aisles and jumping and carrying on. Listen, friend, God tells you to do that. Go ahead. But understand that the Pentecostal power is literally just being indwelt by the Holy Spirit and getting the boldness just to go and be Christians and be the church that God has called us to do. I love John 14. Tomorrow we'll be looking at John 14 about the Holy Spirit coming and all of the things that we would see that would happen because of the work of the Holy Spirit. But tonight I just want to tell you that the church and that Christians need to understand that we don't have to go and discover some new power. We just have to tap into the power that's within us and allow that power to fully come out and for Christ to live through us every single day. The Bible tells us we're to worship in spirit and in truth. I wonder sometimes, are we doing that? If we could have taken you back to Spurgeon's tabernacle. The story goes that Charles Haddon Spurgeon would come out sometimes as he would see the line gathering outside of his tabernacle there. And you might know this or not, but it was sort of a lottery system. They had so many people that wanted to go to this church that most times you could only go in about one time a month. They would literally, you, you'd ha- you, you would have a ticket to get into the church. Wouldn't that be great? But he would go out as he see the line forming and he would walk up to some of the folks waiting to get in and they would recognize him and he would say, would you all like to come in for a personal tour of my tabernacle and they would of course oblige him we'd love to and they would assume that he was going to take take them and show them the sanctuary or maybe his study or maybe some prominent place maybe the bell tower or something like that but he would take them one by one down into the basement down into the boiler room and he says now this is the heart of the church and they would say what do you mean the heart of the church this is just the boiler room and he would explain to them that it was 
was there every single Sunday morning that the saints of God would gather underneath his pulpit and would pray that the power and the fire of God would fall upon him as he would preach the word of Almighty God. Can I tell you something, friend? The church in the 21st century has got all the technology that money can buy. We spent $2,000 last week just to make sure that our old projector was still projected. My goodness. I mean, we've got the fanciest accoutrements, the nicest windows, the fanciest chandeliers and musical devices. I mean, we've got the greatest buses and the greatest personalities. I mean, to tell you, the church is unlike it's ever been before. But I find that it's lacking one thing. Now, it's not talent. We've got plenty of that. It's not charisma. We can muster plenty of that. But it's the power of God. So we need to realize, like, like Spurgeon did, the heart of the church is through, is through prayer and pursuing God and passionately desiring that the power of God be effective every single week. Let me ask you two questions by way of introduction personally. Because we realize that the church is not a building and it's not a body. It's individually coming together as the bride of Christ. So we get that. Have you ever been to Calvary for pardon? Now that's right where the rubber meets the road. Have you ever truly been born again? There's only one way to heaven. The Bible says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The words of Jesus, no man comes to the Father except through me. But the Bible also says that if we'll confess with our mouth and, 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 and believe and accept in our heart and truly repent of our sins, that we will be saved. So have we ever truly been, individually, have you ever truly been to Calvary for pardon? Now, when you look back at Acts chapter 1, these followers of Christ, some were closer, some were at a further distance, but they had been to Calvary. They had seen the work of Christ. Christ had proven himself after many infallible proofs that he was alive. They had accepted this gospel. That's why they were there at this particular time. They had been to Calvary for pardon. But at this point, friend, while they had been to Calvary for pardon, they had not yet been to Pentecost for power. So my second question is, have you truly been to Pentecost for power. I believe in one work of grace, one finished work. When you get saved, you're as much saved as you're ever going to be. Friend, I want you to know when, when God saves you, the Holy Spirit of God indwells you. But has, have you ever come to the point that you were truly equipped and encouraged and engulfed by the power of Almighty God? Have you been to Calvary for pardon and have you been to Pentecost for power? Weakness is rampant in the church and in the lives of individual believers. And I understand that so very well. I struggle with that every single day. Living for Christ will, will drain you. We are up against such a, a huge foe every day and, and, and so many forces out there that are pulling us away and pulling us down. It is very difficult to maintain our strength and to maintain our courage and our boldness. So tonight I want to give you two things. Number one, we're going to look at the virtue of dynamite. And then secondly, we'll look at the victory of dynamite. Number one, the virtue of dynamite. Romans chapter 1, verse number 4 talks about the Spirit of God. And literally, the Spirit of God is called the Spirit of holiness. Holiness, the virtue of dynamite, holiness. Now listen, understand you're never going to be perfect, but that should be our aim. I used to play golf. I don't do that anymore. I mean, four, five, six hours cost you 50 bucks. I mean, come on now. You know, who's got time for all that? But I never in my life have ever gotten a hole in one, except at putt-putt. But on a regular golf course, I've never gotten a hole in one. But every time I teed the ball up, that was my aim. Amen? I wouldn't aim it for the woods. I got there occasionally. I wouldn't aim it for the sand trap. I split, spent plenty of time there. But my aim was always a direct shot right to the green, right in the hole. Friend, can I tell you, there needs to be a pursuit of that in the life of Christians every single day. God, I want, I desire holiness. I desire purity in my life. God, I desire to be like you. We will never know the power of God until we know his purity. The guilt and the shame that overwhelms us will keep us weak and ineffective. Think about this. I call this the case of dynamite. The case for dynamite, maybe. There are a couple of specific instances in the Scripture that I see the power of God overcoming man's frailty, overcoming man's humanity. First was in the case of Mary, Luke 1, 35. The angel of the Lord appeared unto Mary and said, you will, you, 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 you will be with child, you will conceive, you will have a child, and you'll give birth to this child, you'll call his name Jesus. And Mary's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is impossible. 
This cannot be. I'm just a woman. And I've never been with a man. God, I'm not able to produce something pure and holy and wonderful. God, I do not have it within me to do what you're saying that I'm supposed to do. And the angel said, don't worry, Mary. It's not your responsibility to do. It's just your responsibility to allow God to use you to accomplish his perfect and amazing plan. You may be here tonight and you say, Preacher, you don't know about all of my problems and you don't know about my past and you don't know about my failures and you don't know about my weaknesses and all of these things. Oh, listen, friend, God does. And the same power that the Bible said overshadowed Mary and caused her virgin womb to give birth to a child whose name would be Emmanuel, God with us, is the same power that enables us to produce wonderful and, and, and righteous and pure things in life. There's not anything good in me. The Bible says the most I could ever hope to be is a little righteous. And my righteousness equals nothing but a pile of filthy rags. So in and of myself, I cannot produce purity. I cannot produce righteousness. I cannot read enough books, and, and I cannot emulate enough people that I've watched. I cannot read enough of the Bible even and say, well, I want some magic potion so that I can become pure. But literally, it is about us allowing that which is pure in us to be lived out every day. Secondly, we see in Jesus' case, Jesus 100% human, 100% divine. Jesus walking along the river. His cousin says, Behold the Lamb of God that, that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is baptized. And God the Father says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Friend, can I tell you something? When we are truly baptized with the Holy Spirit of God and He begins living through us and begins producing spiritual fruit in, in and through us, that is when the Heavenly Father said, That's my beloved son. That's my beloved daughter. I am well pleased. Why? Because we allow the Holy Spirit to produce something tremendous through us. And He wants to, beloved. In our county, in our association, we have 40 churches and the vast majority of them are, are dying. They are feuding and they are fussing and they are fighting and they are in such a mess. It breaks my heart. They'll call me and say, you know, we don't have a preacher right now. And that's very evident. They go through every two or three years. And, and they'll say, do you know anybody you could recommend to us? And I think, no, no, no. I don't like anybody enough nor hate anybody enough to send them your way. That's for sure. And it breaks my heart. And I'm thinking, do you not realize that you are a church? You are the one institution on this planet that will survive for all eternity. I mean, we have the greatest power of all. We talk about North Korea and we talk about Russia and we certainly talk about our own wonderful military. Friend, can I tell you, there is more power in a thimble full of a gospel of Christ than every tank and nuke that man could ever make. Then why is it that churches are so struggling today? It is because we've never let the power of God overshadow us and everything we do and every vote we take and, 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 and every committee we have and, and, and every program that we have must be overshadowed by the power of God. Number three, in the Christian's case, 2 Timothy 1.9 says that we've been saved and called with a holy calling. Do you know that you have a holy calling on your life? not just for the preachers and not just for those that have a reverend in front of their name, but literally God has called us. He has set us to the side. Think about this. God desires to use every single man, woman, boy, and girl to bring Him glory. Literally, it is like we have been handpicked. You say, well, do you believe there's some handpicked and some that are not handpicked? No, I do not. Let me just give you this. It won't cost you a bit more. I believe we are going to come to a time in our denomination, and I believe it's coming soon, that we will once again be divided. We've been divided about so many things through the years, and I got to serve in our convention when it was a very a good time. There was harmony, and everybody was getting along, but I believe there's going to be a big fight, and I believe it's going to come very soon over Calvinism and, and all of these things. And I don't know where everybody stands on that. I know where I do. Here's what I believe about Calvinism. You ready? I believe that some 2,000 years ago, Jesus hung on a cross. And I believe as he stood there holding literally the sin weight and the debt of sin upon his back of all mankind, he looked to his left and he said to the thief, 
I love you. I'm dying for you. I want to save you. Won't you accept me? Won't you accept this free gift? It has been demonstrated before you even today. Will you invite me to be your Savior and Lord before it's eternally too late? Jesus then looked to his right hand and said, I love you. I want to save you. I am dying for you. My blood is being shed for you as well. Won't you accept me? Won't you allow me to come into your heart and be your Savior and your Lord before it's eternally too late? He did not pick and choose. He didn't say, boy, this one's for you, but it's not for you. You're good enough, but you're not. He said, my grace is sufficient. My power is being manifest today. I am not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And he gave them equal chance. One said yes. One said no. I do not believe he picked a favorite to his left over the one to his right, nor the other way around. Friend, I'm telling you what. There's a lot of things you can call me today, and I've been called about every one. I mean to tell you, but my favorite word that I've ever been called, I find it in John 3, 16. I've been called a whosoever, and I'm thankful that I'm a whosoever that was loved by the one that didn't have to love, but he did anyhow, and I'm grateful for that today. That wasn't in my outline, but it won't cost you any more, I promise. But how important it is that we understand, because you might be here today saying, well, preacher, I believe that God only uses certain people. I believe that God only empowers certain people. Can I tell you, friend, the most powerful people I have ever known that, that God has used are some of the most unlikely. They may not be the most talented. They may not be the most gifted. They may not be the most eloquent, but they simply are willing for the Holy Spirit of God to use them, to use them. Let me give you this real quickly about the virtue of dynamite. Number one, we see the delivery of God's power. Now, let me just give you the time frame. Jesus had died. They had put him in the, in the borrowed tomb. On the third day, he rose from the, from the grave. They would discover that early on the third morning. Jesus would spend 40 days after the resurrection. He would show himself alive. He would testify. He would do many wonderful works. And now Jesus is meeting in the upper room. And he's saying, it's about that time, fellas. Something's getting ready to happen in your life that you will never forget. Peter, you will never deny me again. You will never flee from me again. You will never run from the calling again because something's getting ready to happen in your life. And it is the dunamis. It would be another ten days. The fiftieth day, hence the name Pentecost, meaning fiftieth. On the 50th day after the resurrection, they would be gathered, the Bible says in Acts chapter number 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. That's, I mean, a recipe for revival right there, y'all. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And they appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. Listen, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, the delivery and the promise that came true on Pentecost. It was a wonderful promise. It was a wonderful empowering of the people of God, the delivery of God's power. And you say, well, preacher, that sounds exciting. Where do we need to go? Where can we get in on that? Friend, can I tell you, as an eight-year-old little boy, when a Christian school teacher introduced me to the gospel and it became clear to me and God fingered around my old heart and it, and it pricked me in a way that nothing had ever done and I prayed and asked Jesus to save me of my sin and to come into my heart. As a little bitty eight-year-old boy, the power of the Holy Ghost came upon me just like the power of God came upon them at Pentecost. It happens at salvation, and I'm grateful for that. Don't let that scare you. Don't let that intimidate you. Make you realize that it is something that we're responsible for, that God would allow us to house His power, the delivery of the power of God. That's Pentecost. But there's something else if you're taking notes tonight. Number two, there's the development of God's power. I mean, you've got to know how to channel it. Anybody in here in the car? sweet lady back there. If I wasn't married and you weren't married, I'd marry you. But she's got a cool Jeep out in the parking lot. Love it. It's a white Jeep, baby. It looks almost pretty cool. I like cars. That's my weakness. JB likes cars. He'd raise his hand. He already drifted it off. But, uh, you know, it don't matter. Listen, don't, don't miss this part. It don't matter how big your motor is. 
It don't matter how many horsepower you got, don't matter how big the intake is and how many carburetors sitting up on top of it. Listen, if you don't have a transmission and you don't have a rear differential to get all that power to the ground, all you're going to do is make a whole lot of noise and use up a whole lot of gas. So here it is, guys. We've got to learn to develop that power. God's given us that power. So how do we put it into action? How do we Listen, that's what the purpose of the church is. It's to help us come together and take the power of God and use it to reach our community and, and, and to literally teach people the gospel of Christ. There's the development of God's power. That comes through prayer and Bible study and getting involved in the church and, and not just being satisfied to say, well, I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Listen, if the only purpose of saving you and me was to take us to heaven when we died, then the moment we got saved, he'd have gone on and taken us right then and there and got us out of this miserable place. But he said, no, I'm going to leave you there. Remember Acts chapter 1, verse 8? To be my witnesses. Somebody's got to stay down here and tell everybody what I've done. As he met with those disciples, he said, listen, it's been an amazing journey, guys, and I've got to go. It's, it's, it's my time to leave you, but you're going to see some amazing things when the power of God comes upon you. As I go about and preach in different churches, there's nothing I want to tell churches more than there is power. There is power. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is nothing more powerful than the gospel of Christ on this planet. We must learn to develop that power to make sure that it's getting to the ground, to make sure that it's getting out there into the world in which we live. Number three, there's the demonstration of God's power. Man, I'm tired. Here, don't 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 cut me off quite yet. What is it? Tuesday night? What's on TV tonight? Anything we got to get home for? Fixer up. <laughs> I love the story of David and Goliath. Man, that pizza we had earlier. I, we didn't eat before you came. Why did I do that? Do you remember the story of David and Goliath? Now, now get this. This is really cool. All right. David showed up. You know why David showed up? His daddy, was, his daddy was worried about his older brothers. He said, you need to go check on the boys here. Take them a little something to eat when you go. His daddy wasn't sending him up there to fight a giant. There wasn't a person there that thought he could. But when he got there, nobody else was willing to. He finally said, listen, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. There was a lion and a bear, and they couldn't at me. And I, and I mean, God, God took care of them. That old Philistine, he's no match for my God. So he was excited. I mean, I really believe that. You know why I believe that? Because he, didn't, he wasn't just willing. I mean, he started calling Goliath out. He started charging him. But anyway, what, what did they do? They said, well, okay, David. If you're going to fight Goliath, then we've got to equip you with Saul's armor. Okay? Because they said the strength is going to be in the armor. You've got both your defensive and your offensive strength in your armor. And they begin, I can just see little David now as they begin putting all this armor on him. And, and David can't even hardly stand up. And he finally says, enough, enough. This is not the armor I need. All right? This armor does not fit. And to quote Johnny Cochran, somebody hollered out, just because the armor don't fit, you must not quit. I thought that was good. But, and here's what David said. David said, I don't need it anyway because the power that I have is not the armor on the outside. It is the armor on the inside, the same armor that was with me when that old lion and when that old bear came at me. I know the strength of God. I know the power of God. So here it is. Whenever churches begin thinking, okay, how are we going to tap into the power of God? Here's the way we think. All right, we're going to tap into the power of God by having a dynamic music program. We're going to get, get the house rocking, you know, and I'm all about music. I love it. We're, we're going to make sure that our facilities are top-notch, and they should be. And we're going to make sure that we've got the best staff that money can buy, and we should. And we're going to make sure that everything is just right, and we're building this armor. We're putting this armor around ourselves. And listen, I want to tell you, it doesn't matter how big the church or how small the church, how fancy or how city or how country or whatever it is, we can put every kind of armor on the church that we want to, but until we realize that the armor is not what's on the outside but literally the heart of the church that is the power of God saying we're just going to live out the gospel when David looked at Goliath he wouldn't have been afraid because he was he knew whom he had believed in amen he understood who he represented he understood whose side he was on and who was on his side so when we think about demonstrating the power of God, it's about saying, God, we understand that you are the most powerful and amazing force on planet Earth. You created it 
after all. And you live in us and you dwell in, in dwell us and all of your power is our power. Listen, there are about 17 times in the New Testament that you'll find some you know, way, shape, or form of the Great Commission. And with every time that Jesus said go and make disciples, reach people and teach people the gospel, every time he would say, and I'll be with you. And I'll be with you. And I'll be with you. I love that part. He didn't just say, I'll be with you until I ascend to heaven. But he said, I will be with you. By the way, the promise that we find in Acts 1, it is not conditional. And it has no expiration date. The power that was there in the first century in Acts 2 is the same power that we have today. We must learn to prove God's power. But there's one other thing, and I don't want, before we move to the second point and close out. There's the delivery of God's power. There's the development of God's power. There's the demonstration of God's power. But let me tell you, there's also one other thing. There is the denial of God's power. Is there anything that God cannot do? God cannot fail. But God cannot bless an unblessable situation. Here's what I mean. You ever heard of Nazareth? You ever heard of Nazareth? Nazareth is a town that Jesus grew up in. And the Bible said that Jesus did no mighty works in Nazareth. I heard that for years, and people would get in Bible studies, and they'd say, why do you think that Jesus never accomplished any mighty works in Nazareth? People would say, well, you know, it's probably because he grew up there, and everybody thought of him as the carpenter's son, and all these things, and we would talk about it. No, the Bible tells us. The Bible is absolutely 100% clear Jesus did no mighty works in Nazareth because of their unbelief. That's the only thing that can prevent the power of God from working is our unbelief. You know, I've learned over the last four or five years that God will call you to do some of the craziest things. I mean, He'll ask you to do some of the most illogical things He'll, he'll, he'll cause you to think out of the box and, and go out on a limb. How many of you like to go out on a limb? But can I tell you something? You don't find any fruit up near the trunk. All the fruit's out on the end of the limb. Ever thought about that? Can I tell you, I've, I've gone into church meetings where I was scared to death. I mean sweating and, and perspiring and about into an anxiety attack and about to panic thinking ah my good what are these people going to say if I present this how is this vote going to turn out what are they going to do to me and, and I'd get to the point in my office and I'd say Lord are, are you sure are you sure and he'd say who are you serving who are you worried about upsetting who are you worried about letting down who are you worried about rocking the boat with can I tell you we need never to deny the power of God, but always look at the ways that God... Listen, I want to tell you, God's doing something here. I'm excited. I'm thankful for what God's doing. You could sense the Spirit of God in this place, and, and I go to a whole lot of places, and I can't say that because I'm not going to lie from the pulpit, not knowingly, but I mean, you go in and I'm thinking, God, I'm ready for this week to be over before the first night's come to the end, you know? And I want to tell you, it's been sweet to have been here this week and to see that God is beginning to, to do something truly amazing, and, and I I don't know how long this Spirit of God has been sweeping through this place, but it's exciting. Listen, just open up your eyes. It's kind of like riding waves saying, God, I want to get on board. God, I want to work where you're working. Go through that experience in God's study. Look at where he's at work. God, I want to tap into that power and work alongside of you. That's number one, the virtue of dynamite. I'll close quickly with number two, the victory of dynamite. The victory of dynamite. The virtue is holiness, but the victory comes through boldness through boldness. Here's what I want to leave you with tonight. I want to encourage you on three things. Number one, and it'll be quick, strive and be bold to pursue a dynamic ministry. A dynamic ministry. A dynamite ministry. Powerful ministry. The Bible says, "In whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. God does not bless a half-hearted effort. God does not bless us when we give Him our very least. I think about when the offering plate comes by and people give a tithe. 
and the average person today probably doesn't give a tithe, but let's say we give a tithe. Wouldn't we feel good about ourselves? You know, when we put a tithe in the offering plate, you know what we're saying? God, I'm going to give you the very least. Because that's what he requires. God, I'm going to give you what you require, but not one cent more. People have called me sometimes and said, Preacher, I've been praying about this. Am I supposed to tithe on the gross or the net? I said, hold one minute, and I called my secretary. I said, can you explain the difference in the gross and the net? Because I can't ever remember. Kind of like paper, rock, scissors. God, I'm willing to give you the very least I can. Instead of saying, God, I have but one life to live, and it's yours. I've been bought with the price. I'm no longer my own. God, everything that's mine is yours. Anything that you happen to let me have is just because you've given me the grace to enjoy it. God, it's going to be given back to you. How can I use it to serve you? God, I want to make sure that my ministry is dynamic and it is dynamite. If you read Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4, you see that they were not satisfied just to have weekly meetings. They were not satisfied just to go through the motions. But theirs was a dynamic ministry. Number two, you and I must realize that we are on a dynamite mission. When was the last time you stood in awe of God? Can I tell you, Sunday after Sunday I go to church. And I work hard. I like to help set up everything. And uh, with the two churches that have White Lake, it's at 8.32 a.m. Did I mention you're welcome if you're ever at White Lake? Please come. Um, but then we, we see people start coming in. We have donuts and coffee and juice. That's Most of my friends are here tonight. That's why they come. Don't hurt. Don't hurt. And then it gets till about 8.20. Our service starts at 8.32, I mentioned it. So at about 8.20... Don't you want to know why it's 8.32? I thought so. Because John 8.32 says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So every time I go somewhere and somebody says, 8.32, is that a gimmick preacher? Why is it 8.32? I can introduce the gospel. But anyway. But then there comes that point that's about five minutes before the service, and I kind of get off to myself. And I look around. And almost without exception, every week, my heart is broken in a good way. And I'll begin to weep. And I'll find myself hardly able to breathe. And I'll think, my, my. God, all these people. And I get to be the one to preach. God, I get to be the one of everybody in this room. I get to be the one to stand behind that holy desk. And serve you. Run around like a crazy man sometimes. But I'm the one that gets to do it. But you know that ought to be with every one of us. God, you've allowed us the privilege of sharing the gospel. God, you've allowed us to, the, the, the very privilege of loving the unlovable. You've given us the honor to represent you and to be called a Christian. You've put your very name on the first of our names. When was the last time you stood in awe of God and the mission that he's placed you on? I want to encourage you. I believe you are a mission-minded church. Get out there and get on the mission field. Find you some places. We have a church in New York City. Isn't that cool? A, a church in a town of 246. And we adopted and we partnered with a church in Queens in New York, a, a city of 8 million people as you stretch out. I mean, that's amazing. And I love to go out there. And I, I love to get up there in that big city. And some of these folks have been with us. And you, and you walk down the street and you come to that little storefront church and you think, wow, God, you're allowing me to be a missionary on the streets of New York City. We'll get on a plane and we'll go over to a tiny little country called Moldova. It's right between the Ukraine and Romania where we've adopted a church there. I can preach in Romanian and Russian, well, in English with the Romanian and Russian accents. You ought to hear me. But I mean, and I go over there and the people come from everywhere to see the little funny looking Americans and, and they pack those places out and I get to preach and the interpreters up there and I'm thinking, wow, God, the privilege you've given me to be a missionary for you. But here's the fact, folks at your workplace and at your school and in your communities and in your ball teams and other places, God has called us to be His missionaries. 
It's not just for those on the par and mission field and not just those who are vocational missionaries, but every single one of us. Remember, when Jesus met with us, with, 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 with these followers, he said, and the power of God shall come upon you and you will be my witnesses. In other words, church, you're my witness. Church, you're the world's only hope a dynamite mission. And beloved, as we close, let me encourage you, never, never, never let the enemy, never let your own desires, never let your own traditions defeat the mission that God has placed before you. 2 Timothy 3, verse 5, and I believe this represents so many churches in our land. The Bible said that there would be a church, if you will, and they would have the form of godliness, but they deny the power of God. They're denying the dynamite. I was preaching in a large church not too long ago. I don't preach in many large churches. This is larger than most of the churches I preach in. And I was preaching in this large church. I mean, it's uh, probably cost five or six million dollars to replicate the sanctuary that I was in. And pipe organs, I mean, just amazing. And I stood and I tried to preach and it was as if I was being strangled. And I realized that they didn't much like my kind of preaching. You can't, can you imagine that? I've actually preached revivals, and after the first night, somebody said, yep. Um, after the first night, I've had people come to me and say, can you kind of tone it down tomorrow night? And I'm thinking, like, I got a setting on me somewhere, you know, like, you know. But the fact of the matter is, listen, friend, not everybody wants the power of God to work. In fact, let me tell you, if the power of God gets a hold of you, there's going to be a whole lot of critics, and I'm not talking about outside the church, but even inside of the church, who will stand and condemn you and criticize you, call you a charismatic and everything else, simply because you're living out your faith as the Bible said you're supposed to. Let's have fun as we close. Every time I point at you, I want you to say the word dynamite, okay? Can you do that? All right. One, two, three. Good job. The angel told, told Mary that she would give birth to a little bundle of... In that manger, she wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and in her hands she held... As he was just a lad, he impressed the temple leaders because he was... With every message and every miracle he would ever perform, he was doing that through the power of... In the Old Testament, David fought Goliath. Daniel was in the lion's den. The three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. Joshua over Jericho and the Gideon, and Gideon over the Mennonites, all because they had one thing in common... In the New Testament, it perplexed the Pharisees, it stumped the Sadducees, it saved the sinners, and it set the saints on fire. What was it? It was the guarantee of the great it was the guarantee of the great physician. It was the guarantee of the great commission. It was the promise to Pentecost and the challenge for the church. It was, it was the promise of exceeding abundance. It said, "When we are weak, He is." It gave sight to the blind and sound to the deaf. It took the leper's spots away and set the demoniac free. What was it? It raised the dead to life again. And from the upper room to the garden, from the crucifixion to the resurrection, all the way to the ascension, uh, to, to, to the ascension, it was Pentecostal power. It was the promise of greater things. It is pulpit power today. It is the power for every believer, and it is. The Bible says this. You will be filled with power. But may I ask you, are you willing for that? Think about this. When you're saved, there is an indwelling. When you are saved, there's an indwelling. The Holy Spirit of God, I like this, He packs up all of His stuff and He moves in to your life. All of the fruits of the Spirit, all of the promises and the presence of God, all of the amazing things about God is packed up and the Holy Spirit moves in with all His stuff. He indwells you. But every single day, every single hour and every single moment, we need that constant infilling and infilling and infilling and infilling so that the saints of God might be empowered and prepared and ready. Paul said, I have fought a good fight and I finished my course. Friend, it's time the church start fighting the good fight. Father, thank you. Lord, for the privilege of preaching your word tonight. And God, we've just, Lord, laid out some truths. But now it's up to us, what will we do with what we've heard? Over and over again, Father, we see in Scripture that little phrase, he who hath ears, let him hear. 
And God, I pray tonight that we've not just been impressed with the reality of the power that's ours, but we would have a desire to live by that power when we share our testimony knowing that we're empowered by God, when we're trying to, to, to stand up for what we believe, we're, we're empowered by the presence and power of God. When we're trying to stand against the temptation or the darts of the wicked one, we understand that we have the power of God upon us. God, there may be someone tonight who feels very weak in their walk. God, I pray that they would flood this altar with their presence. And I ask you to fill them tonight like they've never been filled before. But God, there just may be someone here tonight, some young person, some, Lord, adult, even some senior adult here tonight, that, Lord, they've been playing games, if they were to be perfectly honest. They've relied upon their church membership to save them, their baptism. Lord, the rituals that they've performed in the name of Christ but they've realized tonight that they've never been filled with your spirit. They've never been indwelt by the power of God. And Father, they've been trying to live a powerful life with no source of power for way under too long. God, I pray tonight you would break every chain. Lord, that you would allow them to come clean and fresh before you, that you might save them, set them free, and empower them like never before. But God, you just do what you've come to do. Let us get out of the way that you could work in every mind, heart, and life in this room tonight. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Oh, God, save a soul. Set us free. Empower the saints. Lord, empower this church. You have so much for us to do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. As we enter into a time of invitation, would you be honest with God? Would you respond as the Holy Spirit leads you? tonight. Pastor. I'd like for us all to stand and play softly this evening. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. Have you felt the power? Have you felt that spirit tonight? Right now my prayer is no matter where you're at in your life, that the dynamite, you have felt it tonight. You have felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. I pray right now that no matter what you're facing in life, that you step out right now. Maybe you're here tonight and you're saying, God, I've not felt the power lately. Would you come tonight? I'd love to pray with you. I know there's others here tonight that would love to pray with you. Father God, I ask you right now, as many are standing, Lord, as... God, they're debating on what to do. Lord, I pray for the ones here at Westfield Baptist Church, God, that they get their hearts right tonight. They say, God, I want to feel that dynamite. I want to feel that power each and every day, not just, not just for a couple of nights this week, but each and every day in my life. Will you come tonight? Will you step out, take someone by the hand, and just say, I need to feel that power. I've not felt it lately. Maybe you're here tonight and you don't even know what Brother Cameron's been preaching about. Say, I've never felt the power before. I don't know what true dynamite is. Will you come? Will you step out tonight? Come to this altar and just say, please, God, I want to feel that power. If you're here tonight and you're lost, it's so simple. It's not complicated. For Jesus Christ said, for whosoever... That means you tonight. Won't you come? Maybe you're here tonight and you're just, maybe you've gotten away from the Lord. You say, you know, I've not been living like I should. I've had some hurt feelings. I've had some situations in my life I've not handled correctly. Say, God, I need to feel that power tonight. Would you come? Would you just step out and say, God, please? For it's everlasting too late. And dwell in me. Let me feel that power like never before. Church, I know sometimes it's easy to sit there and say, well, I'm not going to step out. We've been here for a while. The music's still playing. But the Holy Spirit is dealing with you right now. That tug upon your heart, it's not me. 
It's the power that only comes from God. Won't you come tonight? As people's praying all across the building, right where you're at tonight, say, God, I need that touch. I want to be just like the apostles. Just like when Pentecost, when that power fell down upon them, they just wanted more and more and more. One night wasn't enough. Two nights wasn't enough. Three nights, even four nights wasn't enough. They wanted to feel it each and every day. My prayer is tonight that you have that desire to feel the Holy Spirit. Won't you come tonight? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, God, Lord, I want to thank you. Lord, I want to praise you tonight for the spirit that we felt here tonight. God, for the amazing things that's happening here at Westfield Baptist Church. God, as we look around, as we see the church is full, God, as we've challenged ourselves, God, and we've asked, God, we all stood right here in this sanctuary and we asked, God, restore in me a new spirit. Restore the joy of my salvation back into my life. God, I pray each and every person that's here tonight, they've done business with you. God, that they, they'll not leave the doors of this church, God, before they take somebody by the hand. God, if there's unfinished business, Lord, I pray that you continue to tug on that person's heart. God, to tug on their mind. Don't let them leave without seeking you. Father God, I want to thank you again. I want to praise you for the one that was baptized Sunday morning. God, I want to thank you for the soul that was saved Sunday. God, I want to thank you for the presence, that sweet, sweet spirit that we continue to feel. Father God, we love you tonight. And Lord, and we praise you. And God, most of all, we want to go and tell the word that we have felt dynamite tonight. Lord, we love you. Father God, and we praise you tonight. And Lord, we make this prayer in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Church, it's been an honor. It's been a privilege to be here tonight. Amen. Have you felt the dynamite? Have you felt it tonight? Can you go out and tell somebody tonight? Dynamite. Amen. That was weak. Can you tell somebody you felt? Dynamite. dynamite. Church, I want to tell you something. I have never in my life been beaten in a game of rock, paper, scissor in front of a church. Amen. <laughs> I've got school tonight. Church, I urge you to go out and tell somebody about Jesus Christ tonight and that you felt the power, amen, the power of dynamite. Church, it's been an honor and privilege to be here tonight, Brother Cameron. Love you, brother. Appreciate you. If you don't mind, I ask you and your wife to step in the back. Church, be back tomorrow night. Look around. Look around. The church is full. Amen. Yeah, White Lake, amen. Take some brochures. Church, it's been an honor and privilege to be here tonight. Let's be dismissed in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, God, we want to thank you. Lord, we want to praise you. God, for the sweet spirit that's here tonight. Lord, I want to thank you for each and every one that's come out to worship in your house tonight, just to lift up and praise you tonight, Lord. As God, revival, God, revival doesn't start. It doesn't start with just one meeting. God, it starts in the hearts and lives of your people. God, and it started. It started right here at Westfield Baptist Church, God, and I pray it just continues to flow over. Lord, we love you, Father God, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.